Volume Three, Chapter Six of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Three, Chapter Four. Vazover, who had passed great part of his night over a bottle, was not, however, at all more disposed to sleep towards morning than if he had been in bed. But at half after seven o'clock he sent the housemaid to know if Miss de Moray was up, and if she was, directed the servant to give his compliments to her, and let her know that he should take it as a favour if she would allow him to speak to her for a few moments before her other friends were assembled celestina had but just fallen into an unquiet slumber when she was awakened by the maid who tapped at the door from an uneasy dream indeed but from a change of uneasiness with her returning memory all the purport of willoughby's letter returned and vassiver's message added most painfully the recollection that she must discuss it all with him she ordered him to be told that she was not very well and could not immediately attend him then shaking off the heavy lassitude which uneasiness and want of rest had occasioned she called to her aid all the strength of mind and rectitude of heart with which she was eminently endowed by nature and having again read over willoughby's letter began to consider what she ought to do with a doubt of such a nature on his mind she resolved whatever it cost her never to meet him but as his sister unless which was very improbable the strong and bewildering circumstances which had given rise to such an idea could all be removed with so much purity did she love him that she felt that were he happy with another and his esteem and tenderness for her undiminished she could be content through life to find her felicity in witnessing his she resolved therefore after much debate with herself and some pangs of unavoidable regret that since this dark and impassable barrier was raised either by nature or by artifice between her and the only man she had ever thought of with fond partiality she would never marry but would leave him at full liberty to complete that union with miss fitzhaman which might at once fulfil his engagement to his mother wean him from that lingering fondness for her which it was folly if not guilt to indulge and retrieve his pecuniary concerns from those embarrassments which were now hastening to overwhelm him having formed this heroic and proper determination she endeavoured to compose her countenance to quiet the agitation of her mind and to meet vassifer with that degree of calm spirit which she imagined from past experience of his behaviour such a meeting would require this however was easier to imagine than to execute she wished indeed to meet him without witnesses because she knew he possessed too little of that delicacy which would teach him to repress any part of his knowledge before strangers as mrs elphinstone and montague thurgood were to him but when she opened the door of the room where she knew he waited for her the blood forsook her cheeks her trembling hands refused the little exertion necessary to turn the lock her feet refused to carry her forward and she would have returned without speaking to him for that time if he who was eagerly awaiting her approach 
had not heard her light footsteps in the passage and opened the door while she was yet hesitating at it he was struck by the fight of her swollen and heavy eyes the languor of her air and the paleness of her countenance and his usual address which had more of warmth and vivacity than elegance was softened by the real concern of which he was at that moment sensible he took her hand which trembled within his as he led her to a feat i am sorry said he to see that you are not well celestina tried to speak but could not vassifer had but an indifferent notion of administering consolation nor could he contrive to console with her for what he secretly rejoiced at himself so that between his dissembled concern and his undissembled satisfaction he sat a moment or two silent and then remarked that the letter he had brought gave a very good account of george's health celestina without having any very precise idea of what she said answered faintly yes and by this time vassifer added that it contained also he supposed like what he had at the same time received the history of a devilish awkward mysterious business celestina who found herself unequal to the conversation thought it better to put an end to it at once and for ever she therefore by an effort of resolution commanded voice enough to say mr vassifer you understand undoubtedly that every idea of the alliance between your friend and me is at an end for ever as for the reasons that exist against it a thousand motives make me wish they may remain secret from this moment therefore you will very much oblige me by forbearing to speak of mr willoughby otherwise than as my best friend and by concealing from the world a secret in which i can have no interest but which will give pain to many to have divulged divulged cried he laughing what then do you suppose it is any secret to be sure i do she replied oh yes answered he that is mighty likely when lady castlenorth has taken such pains to talk of it everywhere already lady castlenorth cried celestina a faint blush rising in her pale cheek a to be sure said vassiver carelessly that she did months ago why don't you know that besides the interest she had in dividing you and willoughby because her daughter is in love with him it seems she always hated his mother and that death itself is no barrier against malice like hers you do think it's probable or possible that this story may be entirely the effect of that malice why faith no i own i do not you know at least people tell me so who do know that it was whispered about a great many years ago and even said that everard was privately married to mrs willoughby but what signifies talking about it added he seeing her again change color you have just been desiring me to say nothing about it george seems to me to have made up his mind about it he will marry his cousin and retrieve his estates as was his first plan and my fair celestina and he took her hand will look out for somebody else to transfer those affections to that he resigns no sir said celestina withdrawing her hand hastily from him they are not i assure you so easily transferred i am glad to hear it replied vassiver without being at all discomposed by her manner for then i hope this pedantic young fellow whom i find here travelling with you 
will not have the presumption to suppose he has any chance of obtaining them pray tell me how comes he here with you is he any relation of the people you are with this was a question it was impossible for celestina to answer ingeniously the piercing and inquiring eyes of vassiver inflamed and fierce from the late hours and free use of wine the preceding night were fixed on her face she changed countenance felt that she did and again her complexion altered the various emotions with which she was agitated consciousness that she must no longer think of willoughby as a lover yet could never admit another to that distinction conscientious too that montagu thoroughgood must appear in the eyes of the world to have succeeded to that place and anger that vassiver should thus presume on the confidence of willoughby to question her with a freedom he had otherwise no pretensions to all combined to affect to distress and to deprive her for a few moments of that presence of mind which from the strength and clearness of her understanding was usually at her command vassiver who from the time he found willoughby must in all probability resign her made no doubt of succeeding to her affections who had no idea of the sensations which pressed on her heart from his total inability to feel them herself from his total inability to feel them himself became irritated and impatient at the silence his own impetuity had occasioned he sat eagerly reading on his countenance the emotions of her heart and interpreting them his own way again he repeated his question how come young thoroughgood with you is he related to those elphinstones you must inquire of him celestina was on the point of saying but the fear lest a quarrel between them should be the consequence of her so answering checked her she tried therefore to evade the question of what concern is it said she how he came hither we were talking of mr willoughby pray tell me is he aware that our supposed relationship is talked of does he know the pains lady castlenorth has been at to circulate the story tis impossible for me to know that said vassifer as it really was it is much more in your way to tell me how this college boy came hither with you i know no right you have to inquire about it answered celestina faintly because i cannot see that it is a concern in which you are at all interested you will give me leave then to make my own conclusions or rather added he in a louder voice on seeing montague thoroughgood enter the room rather to interrogate the gentleman himself this was exactly what celestina had been most solicitous to avoid the impetuosity of vassiver the surprise and anger she saw flashing from the eyes of thoroughgood her sleepless night and long agitated spirits the fear she knew not what the consequences from these two inflammable spirits and her inability to check or repass those over whom she had no pretense to assume any authority were together in a combination of cruel circumstances which might have overcome a stronger mind than hers mrs elphinstone was dejected from situation and languid from recent sorrow of her own to her therefore celestina would in any case reluctantly have applied and now she could not leave the room to seek her without leaving together two men who seemed so highly irritated against each other that the first moment of her absence would probably bring them to extremities
to speak to vassiver was to address the winds or the sea she saw that he was hardly sober that he was incapable of feeling for her distress or of listening to anything but his passionate impetuosity it was on thoroughgood alone she had any hopes of prevailing but in the moment of her deliberation this hope seemed escaping her before she could determine on what to do vassiver had in a manner at once contemptuous and hasty addressed himself to montague thoroughgood and inquired how it happened that he was at york attending on miss elphinstone and miss de moray how it happened sir said thoroughgood is there anything so very extraordinary in it may i not be at york or at canterbury yes replied vassiver when you are archbishop of either and then you will be for aught i know in your right place but at present i think you are in the wrong one what you think sir replied thoroughgood is the last thing that ever can be of any consequence to me and if my actions are as i apprehend as of little to you i imagine we can find some pleasanter topic than either one or the other on which to entertain this lady he then approached celestina who was he saw ready to sink from her chair and softening his voice said you are ill i am afraid no replied she but i am alarmed and uneasy and i beg of you continued she lowering her voice i beg of you to keep your temper let mr vassiver say what he will i can't promise that he said in the same tone but i can promise never voluntarily to do or say anything that shall give you a moment's pain do not be so distressed i beseech you let me find mrs elphinstone you tremble you seem ready to faint i am indeed replied she i affected from numerous causes if you will be so good as to call mrs elphinstone i will be much obliged to you thoroughgood went immediately to obey her and vassiver approaching her cried i see how it is that young fellow is to console you for the loss of willoughby your partiality to him i always suspected and am now too well convinced of it well sir cried celestina assuming in some degree her usual spirit and admitting it to be so i do not really understand by what pretense you call me to account for it by my own long and ardent affection for you cried he of which however you may now choose to affect ignorance you cannot have been ignorant i sacrificed it to willoughby's prior claim and to your visible attachment to him but i am not humble enough to withdraw my pretensions in favour of such a raw boy as montague thoroughgood i am obliged to you sir answered celestina for the predilection you avow in my favour though i cannot command my affection it deems my sincerity and i therefore assure you that though i am now perhaps at liberty i have no intention of engaging myself again i shall hope to be allowed to consider both you and mr thoroughgood as my friends while i absolutely decline any preference to either the pride of vassiver was hurt extremely by this speech though he was not personally vain yet he had from his infancy been so accustomed to have his own way that opposition from any quarter was new and insupportable to him mrs elphinstone and thoroughgood at this moment entering the room he for once checked himself and breakfast being ready he was invited to partake of it which however he declined but told celestina 
on retiring that he must desire to see her again alone in an hour celestina now attempted to repress the various emotions with which she was agitated and to quiet the throbbings of her heart she sat down to the table and tried to eat but could not while montague thorogood watching with eager fondness every turn of her countenance officiously tried to engage her to partake of the breakfast that was before her as soon as she could however she withdrew and after a moment's pause alone her scattered and oppressed senses were collected enough to bring before her all that had happened and tears which she had not hitherto been able to shed came to her relief her reason too came to her assistance and strengthened the resolution she had formed after her first perusal of willoughby's letter but though she was able to decide on what she ought to do herself she had many painful circumstances likely to be created by the violence of vassiver and the impossibility of prevailing either on him or on montague thorogood to leave her and mrs elphinstone to pursue their journey with others or what she would still have preferred of continuing it without the attendance of either when the mind is oppressed with any heavy affliction the less serious evils which at other times it can repel or submit to are felt with painful impatience mrs elphinstone drooping and depressed from her past sufferings and future apprehensions could no longer interpose to check the imputacity of two young men each of whom thought himself at liberty to attend on celestina while celestina herself who never meant to encourage either and whose heart was so recently wounded by the dread of having lost that protection on which she was wont with fondness to rely was yet more unequal to the exertion which was necessary to part these men who were determined to look upon each other as rivals or to keep them within the bounds of civility if they persisted in remaining together anxious to proceed towards the house of cathcart and to put her children under the care of her brother while she herself tried to enter on some mode of life by which to procure them a subsistence mrs elphinstone became impatient of any farther delay while celestina though equally anxious to get forward trembled at the thought of a journey which she foresaw would produce a quarrel and perhaps a duel before they had proceeded three stages sometimes she thought of leaving the whole party abruptly and going on as speedily as possible alone but besides her unwillingness to leave mrs elphinstone she foresaw that if she did this vassiver would follow and overtake her and thorogood would hardly content himself with attempting her friend while well, certain that vassiver was with her after much consideration therefore nothing seemed to remain but to endeavour to prevail on thorogood to go forward without them than which nothing seemed much more unlikely to succeed unless it was the same attempt on vassiver she felt too a reluctance in asking a favour of thorogood which he might interpret as encouragement she never meant to give him and was afraid that the assurances she must make him in regard to her total indifference towards vassiver might afford him reason to hope that towards him she would be less inexorable it was necessary however immediately to make the essay and therefore sending for mr thorogood she with trembling hesitation told him that the letters brought by mr vassiver had been decisive in regard to ending the intended alliance between her and mr willoughby 
but she had hardly uttered the word willoughby before the countenance of montague thorogood was animated with all the warm hopes to which this intelligence gave birth she saw it with concern and with as much resolution as she could besought him to attend to her while with a faltering voice and her tears with difficulty repressed she went on that i shall now never be the wife of willoughby is certain but do not misunderstand me i have determined never to be the wife of any other person i shall go for the rest of the winter to lady horatia howard and afterwards retire to some village as remote as possible from that part of england where i was expected to pass my life this resolution is unalterable but though i never can return as you wish the favorable sentiments with which you have honored me my friendship my gratitude my esteem is in your power to secure and friendship gratitude esteem cried montague thorogood can i be content with such cold words i who can never for a instant disengage my thoughts from you i who worship your very shadow and who cannot bear the thoughts of quitting you even for a moment oh celestina if ever the most pure and violent love deserve a return forgive me cried celestina if in my turn i interrupt you do you not mistake your sentiments or by an abuse of terms call a transient liking by that name which ought to belong only to that refined affection of the heart which leads us to prefer the happiness of another to our own and to sacrifice every inferior consideration to the sublime pleasure of promoting that happiness heaven and earth cried thorogood impetuously and do i not feel that sentiment in all its purity for you would i not lay down my life to procure you any real almost any imaginary good prove it interrupted celestina prove it by obliging me in the request i am going to make a request in which i must not be refused and which before i make it you must absolutely promise to grant i promise returned thorogood who had at that moment no idea whither her request tended i promise to obey you even though you desired my death if the sacrifice i make has any merit in your eyes how cheaply you would approbation be purchased even by the loss of existence all that is very absurd and very wild replied celestina what i ask you can easily do and ought to do without reluctance name it cried he and see how well i can obey you celestina then told him that vassiver fancying his friendship with mr willoughby gave him a right to attend her meant she feared to go on with her and miss elphinstone to london and from the dialogues which have twice passed between you and him added she there is a reason to apprehend that your continuing together may be attended with very unpleasant consequence neither mrs elphinstone or i have courage to encounter the sort of contention which may arise between you and to avoid the hazard of it allow us to thank you for all the trouble you have taken for us and now to bid you adieu till we meet again in devonshire montague thorogood who from the moment he understood her had listened with impatience now protested that the promise he had just given could not be binding in an instance that must be as injurious to his honor as cruel to his feelings why should you suffer this mr vassiver said he to force himself upon you 
while you drive me from you what is this chimercial claim that he derives to willoughby who has resigned his own and how poor and spiritless must i appear who having been permitted that of seeing you thus far on your journey consent to resign to another the honour of attending you to the end of it to another who assumes a right no better founded than my own and to whom i give place for no other reason but because he rudely demands it you would despise me madame and i should deserve to be despised were i capable of so mean a desertion this was exactly what celestina feared but persisting in her resolution to escape the alarm to which she must be subject from vassiver and montague thoroughgoods being together during the journey she told the latter very calmly that unless he consented to oblige her and to go forward under pretense of being obliged to return home that their acquaintance must here end for ever even against this fear his reluctance to yield or to appear to yield the right of attending her to vassiver a while supported him the dread too left vassiver should now succeed for himself and that he should see those hopes destroyed for ever which he so fondly cherished since willoughby was out of the question made him resist still more forcibly the injunctions celestina desired to lay upon him at length his fear of offending her his real love for her and the sight of her uneasiness her assurances that vassiver would never have any particular interest in her favour though at the same time she bade him understand that he had himself no better claim and his wish to shrew her how much he preferred her satisfaction to his own prevailed upon him to sacrifice his pride and his fears to her entreaties and making himself acquainted with the place where she was to be with miss elphinstone in london where he obtained permission to attend to her as soon as she arrived montague thoroughgood though still reluctantly and with great compulsion on himself departed alone and on post horses pursued his way to london having thus prevailed on thoroughgood to depart celestina again sat down to recollect her fatigued spirits she had some hours before determined to write to lady horatia howard and accept the invitation so repeatedly offered to her as soon as she saw miss elphinstone safe in the protection and assistance of cathcart who was to meet them in london this letter therefore she wrote and forwarded and as neither the weather or any other circumstance was now likely to render their progress hazardous mrs elphinstone agreed that they would set out at a very early hour the next morning the day however was of necessity to be ended where they were and it was very certain that vassiver would pass it with them he had ordered for them everything they were likely to have occasion for in a style infinitely superior to what they would themselves have thought of and when they met at dinner he received them as his guests and when his natural vivacity was heightened by that sort of triumph that he felt on finding that thoroughgood was gone his exulting spirits were such as to be cruelly oppressive to both miss elphinstone and celestina incapable of entering into their feelings he had no idea of repressing his own he fancied there no longer existed any obstacle to his project in regard to celestina and as that project had long been the first of his heart and had become doubly important from the opposition 
it had met with he concealed no part of the pleasure he felt at what he fancied the absolute certainty of its immediate accomplishment this was conduct that was insupportably distressing to celestina he spoke without scruple of the resignation willoughby had made of her hand and seemed to have as little delicacy as to the occasion of it of an attachment to him abstracted from every idea of becoming his wife vassiver had no idea and celestina had no courage to urge it so entirely did his want of feeling and the proud certainty he shrewd of his own success overwhelmed her all she could do was to entreat mrs elphinstone not to leave her with him and to assist her as much as possible in attempting at least to check that assuming manner for which neither her former friendship for vassiver nor the regard for willoughby had for him could in her opinion offer any apology fortunately however for both her and her friend two young men of fortune much acquainted with vassiver arrived at the inn early in the evening and seeing his servants inquired for him and were shrewd into the room almost as soon as dinner was over celestina and her friend took the earliest opportunity to withdraw and vassiver's attention to his guests over their wine delivered them for the rest of the evening from his company he had taken care however to inform himself of all that related to their journey the next day but eager as he was to have celestina in the chaise with him he was compelled to desist from the request he at first ventured to make on her representing the impossibility of her leaving miss elphinstone to whom though vassiver heartily wished her once more in the halbreeds he had at length the complaisance to offer his place in his own chaise as being more commodious than the hired ones to be found on the road and agreed on her acquisitions in that arrangement to follow himself in the hack chaise with his servant the gentlemen who had passed the evening with him at the inn were not less fond of the pleasures of the table than he was himself and their orgies had been prolonged till it was no longer worth while for him to go to bed with a very little alteration of his dress therefore and with a great deal of wine still in his head he was ready in the morning to set out but such was his appearance and such his matters in consequence of his debauch the preceding evening that celestina was more than ever solicitous to avoid him and had it been possible for her to have thought of him before with the slightest degree of partiality his looks and his conversation of this morning would have filled her with terror and disgust as she travelled on however by the side of her dejected friend who had no spirits for conversation she could not amid all the reflection on her own circumstances which filled her mind avoid considering with melancholy regret the situation of this young man who with some talents and many virtues was thus yielding to the wild current of passion and vice and destroying his constitution and his fortune before he knew the value of either she then with mournful recollection contrasted his character with that of willoughby who had once all his vivacity tempered with so much sweetness so much attention to the feelings of others who had all his generosity of spirit and openness of heart without any of his careless dissipation and whose brighter talents were not obscured by vice nor degraded by folly and as all his virtue 
all his admirable qualities were enumerated her heart felt all the acuteness of sorrow in remembering too that under their influence she had lost the hope of passing her life yet the cruel pain of the reflection that these hopes were now at an end were immediately mitigated when she considered that this she might perhaps still do as his sister and his friend but her reason however it began to recover its tone could never say anything to her that for a moment taught her to reflect with pleasure or even with tranquillity on the thoughts of being united to miss fitzhaven on reperusing willoughby's letter which she had now acquired courage to study more minutely she saw with new uneasiness what in the first tumult of her spirits had escaped her or at least made but a slight impression that he recommended her particularly to the care and protection of Vassifer, and that, as he had probably intimidated the same trust to Vassifer himself, she should find it very difficult to disengage herself from his attendance. The longer she dwelt on Willoughby's expressions, the more she apprehended he was but too well convinced that the whole story of their relationship did not originate with lady castlenorth she foresaw that while even the shadow of a doubt remained their union never ought to be thought of but having nobody with whom she could properly discuss the various and contradictory ideas on this bewildering subject that passed through her mind she looked forward with earnest impatience to the hour when she should receive the maternal counsel and soothing consolation which lady horatia howard alone was likely to afford her the journey however was to be performed and though she carefully avoided during the two days it lasted being alone with vassiver yet she suffered extreme pain from the increasing conviction that he presumed on willoughby's total resignation of her and openly declared that he thought himself a candidate for her favour whose fortune and pretensions of every kind rendered him secure of success at length the party reached london and cathcart received his sister and her friend at the lodgings he had prepared for them on being informed of the time of their arrival the meeting between him and mrs elphinstone was too affecting to the already depressed spirits of celestina she retired early to her own room having with difficulty prevailed on vassiver to quit her and therefore endeavoured to acquire steadiness to talk over with cathcart the next morning the purport of willoughby's letter and then to take leave of him and her poor dejected friend as lady horatia howard had received with avidity the information of her intended visit to her and was to send her coach for her at one o'clock on the following day end of volume three chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume three chapter seven of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c celestina by charlotte turner smith volume three chapter seven the morning at length arrived and the friends who had so long found all the consolation their circumstances admitted of in being together were now to part uncertain when or if ever they were to meet again mrs elphinstone sinking as 
she was under oppression of many present furrows and future apprehensions yet found them all deepened by the loss of celestina who had so generously assisted her in supporting them and celestina felt that when to soothe the spirits and strengthen the resolution of her friend was no longer her immediate task she should dwell with more painful and more steady solicitude on her own singular and unfortunate situation cathcart warmly attached as he was to both from gratitude and from affection had no power to speak comfort to either early in the morning he had met celestina and gone through willoughby's letter but though his mind sometimes strongly resisted the idea of that relationship of which it spoke he had nothing to offer against it and could only sigh over the incurable unhappiness with which he saw the future days of friends he so much loved would be clouded silently they all assembled round the breakfast table but nobody could eat cathcart tried to talk of jessie of his house of his farm of his fortunate prospects and of his sister's two little girls whom he had taken home but there was w not one topic on which he could speak that did not remind him of the obligations he owed to celestina and willoughby nor one idea which arose unembittered with the reflection that they to whom he was indebted for all his happiness were themselves miserable about twelve o'clock vasover came into the room in his usual way inquired eagerly of celestina when she went to lady horatia howard's and when he could see her there and without waiting for an answer to his inquiry told her that he had that morning met sir philip molyneux and that lady molyneux had been in town about a week everybody who were related to willoughby was interesting to celestina and from lady molyneux she had always supposed more might be collected than from any other person but now her mind was too much oppressed and too much confused to allow her to distinguish her sensations or to arrange any settled plan for her future conduct towards lady molyneux she received vassiver's information therefore with coldness and indeed her manners towards him were very constrained and distant which he either did not or would not notice rattling on in his usual wild way though he saw the dejection and concern of the party a circumstance that more than ever disgusted celestina who began some time before to doubt whether the credit which vassiver had for good nature was not given him on very slender foundations for to be so entirely occupied by his own pleasures and pursuits as to be incapable of the least sympathy towards others to be unable or unwilling to check for one moment his vivacity in compliment to their despondence seemed to celestina such a want of sensibility as gave her a very indifferent opinion of his heart mrs elphinstone quitted the room to make her the last preparations for her departure but cathcart who had fettled everything before remained with celestina and vassiver he would have given the world to have passed these moments in conversation with her but the presence of a third person and especially of vassiver put an end to all hope he had of an opportunity of explaining to her with that tenderness and caution which the subject required some circumstances relative to willoughby's fortune which had lately come to his knowledge new embarrassments seemed threatening him and a lawsuit 
involving part of the property which belonged to alvastone's estate seemed likely to increase these embarrassments while the mortgagees were gradually undermining the estate itself and the absence of the master increased the impatience and mistrust of those who had claims upon it all this cathcart thought celestina ought to know yet in their first interview that morning he had not courage to tell her of it and now vassiver left him no chance of doing it for while he yet deliberated the coach sent by lady horatia howard stopped at the door and the moment was come in which he was to take his leave of her he took her hand and kissed it with an air of grateful respect but he could only say i shall write you in a few days and i hope give you a good account of my sister and of jessie i hope you will returned celestina faintly and added he you will of course like to hear of all that passes material in our neighbourhood certainly i shall replied she adieu dear sir i cannot say much but you know what i feel for you all vassiver had taken her hand to lead her down the stairs but she disengaged it from him and said to cathcart as she gave it to him let us go to your sister he led her to the door of the room where at that moment mrs elphinstone entered pale and breathless her eyes were heavy and fixed on celestina but she did not weep celestina's tears however were more ready and as she embraced her friend they choked the trembling adieu she would have uttered and fell in showers on her bosom the emotion was too painful and cathcart desiring to end it for both sakes disengaged his sister gently from the arms of the trembling celestina while vassiver again seizing her hand hurried her downstairs and as he put her into the coach he told her he should call upon her the next day she would have besought him not to do it as a liberty he ought not to take in the house whither she was going but before she could sufficiently recover herself to find words the coach was driven away and in a few moments she found herself at the door of lady horatia howard in park street grosvenor square and it became necessary for her to collect her spirits to acquit herself as so much kind attention deserved lady horatia received her with unfeigned pleasure and with a degree of maternal kindness that set her almost immediately at ease with herself she was put into possession of her apartment and begged to remember that it was hers as long as she would occupy it and that her time was always to be her own i am going out said lady horatia to dinner to-day i have a great notion you had rather dine at home celestina owned she had be it so then replied she and whenever you prefer being at home to going with me i shall be pleased at your using that freedom without which such a situation as i am able to offer you would be not only of no value but a species of slavery while she said this in the kindest manner celestina observed that she looked very earnestly at her eyes which were red with weeping and examined with a kind of mournful inquiry her features which bore traces of the concern she had felt in parting from her friends and having thus examined her countenance some time her own which was remarkably expressive assumed a look of surprise tempered with concern and then as if she checked herself she rang for her woman to receive orders about celestina's dinner and while they remained together 
she gave the conversation a more general turn when celestina was alone she ran over in her thoughts the transactions of the last month and wondered what fate would do with her next but not of herself alone she thought willoughby unhappy and unsettled his mind thrown from its balance by disappointment his talents lost in the bewildering uneasiness of uncertainty and his temper injured by the corrosive anxieties of pecuniary inconvenience he who had such a mind such a heart such talents such a temper who deserved every happiness and yet had hitherto known none willoughby wandering about the world to in obtain confirmation of a fact which when known would only complete his misery was an object from which the thoughts of celestina could never a moment escape and a thousand times she wished she had never been born since to her to whomsoever she owed her birth willoughby certainly owned his unhappiness it was time to consider of obeying the injunction he gave her towards the close of his letter to write to him but on this subject she determined to consult lady horatia howard as well as to ask her advice in what way she should act in regard to vassiver whose inopportunities she dreaded yet from whose visits she knew not how to disengage herself under such protection however she knew that much of the inconvenience she must in other circumstances feel from vassiver's behavior would be obviated and that the sense as well as the situation of lady horatia would prevent that improper familiarity which when she was only with cathcart or mrs elphinstone whom he looked upon as inferior and as dependent it was too much his nature to assume with more complacency she thought of montague thurgood and always of his father with a degree of affectionate reverence as to the young man though her heart never admitted in regard to him the slightest tendency towards that sort of partiality which could ever grow into love yet she had received so many marks of real and ardent attachment from him she thought so well of his talents and so much better of his heart that she could never divest herself of solicitude for his welfare perhaps for in what heart however pure does not some weakness lurk perhaps the story she had heard of his former universal propensity to form attachments and which were intended to prejudice her against him had an influence on her mind of which she was herself unconscious and that her self-love though no human being ever appeared to have less was gratified by having thus fixed a man so volatile and unsteady though she never could nor ever have given him reason to suppose she could return the passion she had thus inspired while there remained any hope of ever seeing willoughby such as he had once been she had felt an utter repugnance to suffer the acidities of montague thurgood but willoughby's apparent neglect of her for some time before she left the isle of sky and in the little probability there now was that they could ever meet in peace since the receipt of his letter had gradually and almost insensibly accustomed her to the attentions of montague thurgood and though she felt for him nothing like love she could not help being sensible of a great difference in her sentiments towards him and towards vassiver one seemed to live only to obey and obliged her the other presuming on the advantages of fortune 
or on those which willoughby's friendship gave him appeared rather to demand than to solicit her regard rather to resent her neglect of his suit than court as a favor her acceptance of it and if celestina had any fault it was a sort of latent pride the child of conscious worth and elevated understanding which though she was certainly obscurely and possibly dishonorably born she never could subdue and perhaps never seriously tried to subdue it she felt that in point of intellect she was superior to almost everybody she conversed with she could not look in the glass without seeing the reflection of form worthy of so fair an inhabitant as an enlightened human soul and could she have been blind to these advantages the preference willoughby had given her so early in life would have taught her all their value it is not the consciousness of worth that is offensive and disgusting but the tribute of respect that is demanded of others who have perhaps no such conviction and of whom there is therefore unreasonable and arrogant to expect that they will acknowledge what they cannot perceive nobody was ever yet eminently handsome in person or eminently brilliant in intellect who did not feel from self-evidence that they possessed those advantages though many from the infirmity and weakness of their tempers fancy they exist where none but themselves can find any shadow of them good sense one prominent feature of which is due attention to the opinion and to the self-love of the rest of the world will rarely suffer those who possess it to obtrude even real advantages on the notice of others and without good sense little distinction appears between the real bloom of youth and beauty and the factitious charms purchased at a presumer's both are if not equally disgusting equally devoid of all that can make them estimable or valuable of this good sense celestina possessed such a share that conscious as she was of that superiority of which she was continually told no village girl had ever more unaffected simplicity of manners and while her mind was irradiated by more than common genius and her knowledge very extensive for her time of life she was in company as silent and as attentive to the opinion of others as if she had possessed only a plain and common understanding with no other cultivation than what a common boarding school education afforded her pride therefore so moderated was rather a virtue than a blemish and taught her to value herself but never to despise the rest of the world there was about her too much of that disposition which the french called amity a disposition to please by seeming interested for others by entering into their joys and sorrows and by a thousand little nameless kindnesses which though they consisted perhaps only in attending patiently to a tale of sorrow told by a mourner of whom the world was tired or who was tired of the world or listening with concern to the history of pain and confinement related by the valetudarian smiling at the fond enthusiasm of a mother when she described the wit or beauty of a darling child or admiring the plans which an improver had laid down for the alteration of his grounds were all so many testimonies of a good disposition in the opinion of those towards whom these little civilities were exerted that celestina had formerly 
had almost as many friends as acquaintance whenever she appeared in the circle where she was now to move more splendid even than that where mrs willoughby's kindness had placed her it was probable that under such introduction as that of lady horatia howard all the charms of her person talents and temper would be seen to the utmost advantage unaccustomed as vasover was to look far into consequences had he discerned this as soon as he heard of the invitation celestina had received and he foresaw so many impediments to the pursuit of his wishes as well as the severity and pudentry which he had heard imputed to lady horatia as from the interference of rivals that he would very gladly have persuaded her against accepting it had he any pretence to offer for his objections but having none and not daring to invent any he had confined himself to mutterings against prudish old cats and representing to celestina that she was going to confine herself as humble companion to bear all the caprices of a superannuated woman of quality celestina heard him at first with concern from an idea that he had heard lady horatia misrepresented but when on his afterwards repeating this conversation she found that he knew nothing of her character even from report and only described her in so unpleasant a light from his wish to deter celestina from finding an asylum in her house anger conquered her concern and even her complaisance and she besought him in very strong terms never again to name lady horatia howard to her unless he could prevail upon himself to remember that she deserved from her character rather than her rank the respect of every man and particularly of every gentleman vasover had desisted then from talking of her in this style but he was not all more reconciled to the abode celestina had chosen where if he was admitted to see her at all it would probably be only in the presence of those who would be little affected with his professions of that love which every day became a greater torment to him and little days by that fortune which he had to offer as the price of its return celestina however to whom he had repeatedly said that he would visit her though she had not too soon apprised lady horatia to her situation and the first hour they were alone together lady horatia expressed such a desire to know all that had passed in regard to willoughby since she saw her on the journey into scotland that celestina without hesitation but not without great emotion related it all and put into her hands the letters received from willoughby lady horatia read them and attended with great interest to what celestina related of the sudden appearance of montague thorogood and the avowed pretensions of vasivir and after deliberating some time she smiled yet not with a smile of pleasure and said it appears my love as if you were only come to tantalize me for a moment with your company for beset as you are by these young men i see i shall never be able to keep you long ah madame replied celestina neither mr vassiver nor mr thorogood can incite a wish in me to quit your protection while it is convenient to you to afford it to me and for my first my most beloved friend my what shall i call him 
he talks not of returning to england and if he does and if he does return interrupted lady horotia you must and rightly formed as your heart is you do i am sure understand that while the faintest mist of doubt hangs over you you ought never to meet him unless indeed one of you were married allow me to ask madame said celestina in a tremendous voice allow me to ask your ladyship who were so well acquainted with mrs willoughby whether from any recollection of remarks made in her lifetime you have any persuasion as to the foundation of those doubts you might have seen replied lady horotia from the purport of a letter i wrote you while you were in scotland that i had even then heard rumours of the cause of your separation from willoughby which lady castlenorth had very industriously set forth i judged from what i then heard that if it were not true her art would be so effectually exerted that you would never discover the deception and that you must be rendered unhappy it was therefore i advised you to detach yourself as much as you could from what is childishly called a first love i thought that what mr willoughby was then said to be on that point of completing his marriage with miss fitzhaman was the very best thing he could do both for his own sake and yours for if it should be found you are related the very idea is attended with too much horror to be dealt upon and even if it is a fabrication of lady castlenorth's unless it can be clearly proved to be so your whole life might be embittered by it besides my dear celestina how could mr willoughby circumstanced as i understand he is in regard to money manners how could he afford to marry you celestina sighed deeply from the recollection of their arrangements as to all those affairs which willoughby had so fondly made and to which she had so fondly listened then recovering herself she repeated the question which she thought lady horatia had evaded but has your ladyship any recollection of circumstances in mrs willoughby's conduct or life that gave you reason to believe this unhappy story may not be the fabrication of lady castlenorth not from my own knowledge replied she for i was in italy with general howard who was then in an ill state of health at the time mr willoughby's father died and for two years afterwards when i returned to england i was absorbed in domestic uneasiness and heard without attending much to them those gossiping stories which fly about for a week or a month till some newer scandal causes them to be forgotten yet i do recollect i own hearing some hints of mrs willoughby's partiality for mr everard and that they were supposed to be privately married but i accounted for it when i attended to it at all by recollecting that mrs willoughby was at the time of her husband's death a young and beautiful woman with a good fortune and an admirable understanding advantages which while they created envy and malignity in the minds of a hundred people who possess nothing of all that among her own sex produced as many pretenders to her favor among the other every one of them though some were men of rank and of course eminent enough in their own eyes were dismissed by her on their first application with a polite but positive refusal these men were piqued and these women were spiteful 
and they together found out a reason for the unheard of refusal of a young and admired widow by supposing her unattached to her son's tutor not one of them from the information of their own hearts being able to conceive it possible that she made this sacrifice to maternal tenderness and refused a hand to a second husband because she would suffer nothing to interrupt the attention she owed to the children of the first you do not then believe said celestina eagerly you do not then believe my dear madame that there is any truth in this odious story pardon me answered lady horotia i did not say so gracious heaven exclaimed celestina it is possible you can believe it my dear young friend said she calmly i have lived so long in the world that though i do not hastily and on slight grounds believe such a report yet i should not wonder were it in the event to be verified celestina who had always in her own heart opposed the idea of her being the daughter of mrs willoughby thought she felt and submitted to the necessity of seeing willoughby no more when one doubt remained unsatisfied now changed color affected as well by the manner of lady horotia as by what she said she had not however courage to press her farther but spoke of the visit intended her by mr vassiver i wish it were possible said she to convince him at once that i shall never listen to the proposal with which he is pleased to honor me as willoughby's friends added she and sighed i shall be always glad to see him but in any other light never and i think you wrong however replied lady horotia in wishing so hastily to dismiss him he is a man of family of fortune and as you allow not disagreeable in his person and for his morals they are not worse i suppose than those of other young men he is allowed i think to be generous good-tempered and not to want sense if every idea willoughby is at an end why not relieve yourself and him from a state of uneasy retrospection by receiving the addresses of one whom he cannot disapprove are you in earnest lady horotia cried celestina certainly i am replied she at least i venture very seriously to advise you not to dismiss vassiver so hastily but receive him as an acquaintance till you are sure you disapprove of him as a lover dear madame resumed celestina were i capable of giving away my hand so lightly is mr vassiver a man who you think could make me happy nay replied lady horotia if there is anybody whom you prefer that is another point i only say that if you feel yourself perfectly disengaged i cannot think vassiver ought to be dismissed hastily perhaps half the young women in london would think a more desirable match could not offer this conversation was interrupted by the entrance of a servant who announced the arrival of a person who was the subject of it and vassiver immediately entered the room he condescended to pay to lady horotia more respect than he generally shrewd to those who were indifferent to him hers was however that sort of company in which he by no means found himself a case and his eagerness to entertain celestina alone once or twice broke through the restraint which he imposed upon himself lady horotia who was candid and liberal saw in him only an unformed and unsteady young man whose morals and manners required nothing but time and good company 
to render estimable she saw the prejudice celestina seemed to entertain towards him as a mere prejudice and on his rising to depart gave him a general invitation to her house celestina who knew the refinement of her mind and the delicacy of her taste was amazed at seeing to approve him and when he was gone ventured to say what does your ladyship think of mr vassiver why really very well replied she he is very young and quite unformed but with those giddy manners and amid that unpolished conversation there is no want of understanding celestina again sighed no answered she no want of understanding certainly for willoughby was not likely to select him for his friend had that been wanting but yet they were so unlike so very unlike that i have often wondered at their long and intimate friendship vassiver is so headlong so impetuous so self-willed and sometimes so boisterous while willoughby with more imagination more genius more strength of understanding is so calm so reasonable so attentive to everybody she was too much affected to proceed in the catalogue of his virtues a subject on which she had hardly ever touched before but stopped from the emotion she felt and lady horotia who saw and pitied the source of that emotion changed the conversation vassiver flattered by the reception he had met with from the present protectress of celestina and more in love than ever in proportion as she was in his opinion infinitely handsomer now than ever was now very frequent in his visits while celestina's whole mind was occupied by the necessity she was under of writing to willoughby and the difficulty she was under how to answer with propriety such a letter as that she had received from him at length with many efforts and more tears the letter was written and approved of by lady horotia and celestina endeavoured in compliance with the wishes of her friend and with more earnestness than success to dismiss from her mind some of its corrosive sensations and to enter if not with avidity at least with cheerfulness into that style of fashionable life which though she could not always enjoy she never failed to adorn End of Volume 3, Chapter 7 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 3, Chapter 8 of Celestina This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 3, Chapter 8. Vassiver had been with her every day since her arrival in town, which was almost a week, and Montague Thorogood had never appeared while celestina at once wondered at his absence and rejoiced at it though perhaps her sensations were mingled with a slight degree of mortification for while she disdained every species of coquetry she yet felt humiliated by the sudden cessation of that attachment which he had taken such pains to convince her could not be destroyed even by despair impatience however to hear of willoughby was still predominant in her mind and for this purpose she wished to see lady molyneux no acquaintance subsisted between her and lady horotia and therefore she determined to write and beg leave to wait on her old friend 
this she executed in a note to the following purport miss de moray being in town for a short time solicits permission to wait on lady molino at any time when her ladyship may be disengaged this note was delivered to lady molino in company she read it as if she had forgotten totally the claim celestina had upon her from their having been brought up together and from her mother's fondness for her she asked carelessly whether the messenger waited for an answer the servant replied that he did lady molino had formed an idea that celestina of whom she had not thought for many months was now wandering about the world in a dependent and inferior situation and might perhaps expect an invitation to stay with her which she had no inclination to give she therefore in a cold and careless way bade the footman to tell the person who brought the message that being then engaged with company she could not write an answer but would take an opportunity of letting miss de moray know when she should be at home she then entered again into conversation with her guests and it was not till the next day that she remembered having heard from celestina at all when seeing the note on her table as she was going to dress for the opera she gave it to her maid and bade her put her in mind to send an answer to it and fix the first morning she should be disengaged celestina in the meantime received the verbal answer to her note with more concern than surprise she had not expected much kindness from matilda who during so many months had never written to or inquired after her but she could not without internal anguish reflect that it was the daughter of her more than mother the friend of her orphan youth and the sister of willoughby who was thus insensible of all those feelings which swelled her heart when the scenes of that orphan youth and the pleasures of that infantine friendship were remembered amid these painful reflections however there was one that gave her some degree of consolation she thought that lady molino could not either from any knowledge of her own or from the report spread by lady castlenorth believe that any relationship by blood subsisted between them for she supposed it to be impossible for her in that case to treat with so much cold neglect a person whom she knew to be her sister on this therefore she dwelt as a circumstance favorable to the notion she most wished to entertain and as two or three days passed on without her hearing from lady molino her eagerness to inquire of her subsided into a strong belief that she knew nothing vassiver assiduously attended every day at the house of lady horotia during this interview and contrived to obtain for himself some degree of interest in her favor the openness and candor of his temper was with her an apology for half his faults while his youth and natural vivacity obtained his pardon for the rest his fortune was splendid and his family ancient and respectable while his person was such as could hardly fail to please and his manners careless and wild as they were appeared to advantage in the eyes of lady horotia who had been disgusted by the coldness and apathy either real or affected of many of those young men of fashion who frequented her house on celestina however the frequent opportunities she had of observing vassiver had a very opposite effect in her mind a standard of perfection had been early formed and every man she now saw was pleasing or otherwise as they resembled or differed from willoughby she continued therefore to treat vassiver with increasing coldness 
and saw with concern that Lady Horatia was every day more solicitous for his success. Willoughby, in the meantime, continued to wander about Europe without any fixed plan, and merely flying from himself. Still anxious to gather information on the subject which had destroyed all the happiness of his life, and having little hopes of obtaining any, but by means of Lady Castlenorth, he often conquered his reluctance, and visited his uncle at a villa he now inhabited near Naples, where he was always received with pleasure, and where, save only on the point which alone interested him, Lady Castlenorth seemed to descend from her natural character to endeavour by every means in her power to gratify and oblige him, and her lord, who really loved his nephew as much as his imbecility of mind allowed him to love anybody, and who saw in him and in his alliance with his daughter the only chance of perpetuating a family which was the great object of his pride, became hourly more eager to see him, and more gratified by his company. It had been observed that there are two reasons which equally operate in determining some people to marry love and hatred and something resembling both these sentiments agitated the heart of miss fitzhaman of an involuntary preference to her cousin she had been sensible from the first moment she saw him and his indifference his preference of celestina and even his positively declining the honour of her hand had mortified without curing her of her partiality, though resentment and disdain were mingled with the inclination she could not conquer, and which neither his absence nor his coldness had prevented from gaining on her heart. When she saw him again, new force was given to this passion. He was less handsome, less animated, but more interesting and more pleasing while his melancholy and dejection, though created by another object, gave him so many charms in the opinion of Miss Fitzhaman, that her pride yielded to them, and, as it was now, very certain that he had no attachment but to Celestina, whom, since she fully believed their relationship, she knew he could never marry, she doubted not of being able to inspire him with an affection for her, and in returning to England his wife, of fulfilling at once her parents' wishes and her own. Lady Castlenorth, whose love of intrigue time had by no means diminished, whose arrogance had been deeply wounded by the failure of her original plan, which she fancied Willoughby would with so much eagerness have embraced, was now doubly anxious to avail herself of the advantage she had gained by having prevented the intended union of Willoughby and Celestina. Pique and resentment operated upon her mind with even more force than attachment and regard would have on another. Besides, in the marriage of her daughter with any man of superior rank and independent fortune, she found great probability that her influence would be lessened and her government disclaimed. But in uniting her daughter with Willoughby, whose fortune was in disorder and whose temper was remarkably easy, she foresaw the continuation of her power and that she should neither see her daughter take place of her or escape from her influence. Whatever was the wish of her friends, the assiduous Mrs. Calder officially adopted, and when she found how much Lord Castlenorth had set his heart on concluding the marriage, between his daughter and her nephew she applied all her rhetoric to prove its advantages and all her art 
to secure its success willoughby was unconscious to the plans that were thus forming in the family of his uncle and did not think it possible that their pride would allow them to solicit again an alliance which he had once declined he therefore went to them without any apprehension that he was encouraging expectations he never meant to fulfill and had indeed no other design than to lay in wait for traces of that involved mystery which he still thought had been created by the intrigues and machinations of lady castlenorth in art however she was so much his superior that the very means he adopted to obtain satisfaction was in her hands a means of bewildering more deeply she now affected the most perfect candor and whenever she saw him touching with a tender hand on the subject she appeared to feel for his uneasiness and ready to give him every satisfaction in her power willing to avail himself of this apparent disposition in his favor he one day when he was sitting alone with lady castlenorth asked her whether she had now no traces of hannah biscoe the servant who alone seemed possessed of the circumstances into which he most wished to inquire lady castlenorth answered with great apparent ingenuousness that she did not exactly know as she had no connections at all with her but that if he wished to make an inquiry her woman should write out the directions to her relations which she did not herself recollect willoughby eagerly seized on this offer and begged that these directions might be immediately written out for him lady castlenorth instantly called her woman and questioned her as to her recollection of the abode of the relations of this hannah biscoe the woman named what she knew her lady directed her to put it down and willoughby left the house flattering himself that he had at length obtained a clue which might lead him to escape from the labyrinth of error a mistake where he had so severely suffered it was however by no means lady castlenorth's plan to suffer willoughby to return to england in search of this woman whose directions she seemed so willing to give him and as from the eagerness and agitation he expressed on receiving this paper it appeared but too likely that he meditated going himself in order to preclude the possibility of his views being again frustrated she found that all her art would be necessary to prevent his escaping her fortunately for her views lord castlenorth was seized a few hours later with one of those illnesses which had so often reduced him to the brink of the grave and the presence of his nephew which he so earnestly desired the generous and feeling heart of willoughby could not deny which he endured the cruelest restraint in staying and thought every hour an age till he could go himself to england and renew his hitherto hopeless research after the real situation of celestina thus passed however a month after the arrival of celestina in london and then the arrival of an english gentleman at naples brought him her letter written in answer to that she received at york nothing could equal the impatience with which he had expected this letter but the pain he felt at reading it he learned by it that she was returning to london where he fancied so many objects would combine to soften her concern for their separation and he fancied the letter expressed too much calmness and that she submitted to the separation which he had himself indicated as too likely to be inevitable 
without feeling half that regret and anguish which he had expected she would have described the reluctance she expressed to be left to the protection of vassifer made him believe his presence interfered with her preference to some other person a preference of which the very suspicion threw him into agonies at the very moment his reason told him that he ought not to think of her for himself jealousy now added to the pangs of disappointed love and the letter which celestina had endeavored to word so as to calm and soothe him and to teach him to submit to that necessity of which he allowed the force seemed to him to breathe only indifference and to prove that she saw him without regret relinquish his claim to those affections which were already in possession of another all his sufferings were confirmed and increased when a day or two afterwards he had an opportunity of conversing with mr jarvis the gentleman who brought the letter and who was hastened to rome he had been often in company with celestina at parties where she attended lady horatia howard and believing as all the world now did that willoughby was certainly to be married to miss fitzhaman and that the marriage of celestina would be a subject of satisfaction to him he related without hesitation the reports he had heard of her being soon to give her hand to mr vassifer to the amazement willoughby expressed at the first intimation of such a match jarvis who entirely mistook its cause said yes it is wonderful to be sure considering all we know of vassiver that he should seriously intend to marry so acute was the pain which the intelligence willoughby had just received gave him that he could make no answer to this and jarvis fancying him out of spirits for some reason or other which he never thought of inquiring after soon after left him to meditate on what he had heard there was room for meditation even to madness when he recollected a thousand circumstances that had till now appeared of no moment he was convinced that vassiver had long admired celestina he had himself resigned her or at least imitated that he dared not think of her and the person the fortune the impetuous ardor of vassiver which had which his agitated mind represented as irresistible now all crowded on his recollection and he doubted not but be that before he could reach england celestina would have given herself away yet with the horrid mystery unremoved on what pretense could he wish or even think of impeding a marriage with a man of whom his regard was evinced by his long friendship and, and who had so affluent a fortune as a lover he could himself no longer interfere as her relation he could not bear to consider himself and were he only such an alliance with vassiver could not be objected to on any reasonable grounds the longer he reflected therefore on what he had heard the more unable he became to support his reflections and they concluded in a resolution to set out immediately for england a determination which he communicated to his uncle the same day who was affected by it even to tears lady castlenorth had in conversation with mr jarvis heard the report of celestina's intended marriage and knew immediately how to account for this extreme uneasiness willoughby betrayed and his sudden resolution to depart for england when jarvis 
who proceeded immediately on his journey, was gone, she found an opportunity a few hours afterwards to speak to Willoughby on English news, and the change of his countenance confirmed her conjectures. There was an occasion not to be lost, she ventured, what she usually avoided, to name Celestina and to express her satisfaction that she was likely to be so well married. After all the conversation there has been about this young person, she said, affecting to have a great deal of feeling for her, I am very glad that the poor girl will be so well established. A man of Vassiver's independent fortune can well afford to please himself, and I doubt not but that you and Lady Molyneux must on every account rejoice at her change of name, and that nothing more will be said of her origin. Though Lady Castlenorth affected to speak with sentiment and to soften her voice, her piercing and inquiring eyes were demanding from the countenance of Willoughby that explanation which she knew it would give of his real sentiments, and she saw that the blood forsake his cheeks, his lips turn white and tremble, and a mingled expression of doubt, fear, anger, and disdain marked on his features. If I were certain, madame, said he, that all the odious reports on which you, who first promulgated them, have invariably refused to satisfy me as you might do, if I were sure that they were all true, if, interrupted Lady Castlenorth, can you then doubt their truth? Will you compel me to make, by adducing these proofs, a matter public which you ought on every account to wish might be buried in eternal oblivion? Will I compel you, madame? Yes, surely. I will, if the means are in my power. Tis for this only I have been so much with you, not to compel you indeed, but in the hope of prevailing upon you, if you really possess the evidence you have often mediated, to give it me all without reserve. Well, cried Lady Castlenorth, I have now given you a direction to the only person who is in possession of this evidence. You might have procured it a long since, as when I interfered to save you from the horrors of a marriage which must have rendered you and the object of your unhappy placed affection miserable for ever. But then you flew from me and resented my friendship as if it had been an injury. Since that time, it is not my fault if you have been unable to find this person, whom I have never secreted, and of whom I know little or nothing. Satisfied in having saved you from an abyss of guilt and misery, I trusted to time and your principles to convince you of the injustice your suspicions did me. You have searched for prose in those places where your mother is said to have been with her young charge. Tell me, have you ever found any reason to believe the facts I told you of to be of my invention, to have been totally unfounded? Willoughby was conscious he had not, yet at the same moment he discovered that Lady Castlenorth had watched him, and knew of the journeys he had made to Heres and to other places. Vexed and angry, not knowing what to think, or whether he was imposed on by her superior cunning, or was needlessly tormenting himself in pushing the inquiry farther, he could not command the various uneasy sensations with which he was agitated, and therefore abruptly leaving the room, he hastened to its lodgings, and gave directions for his immediate departure for England. He was concerned, however, for his uncle, 
and returned in the evening to take leave of him he found him sitting with mrs calder who was reading to him a sort of catalogue raisonne of the various ills to which the human body is subject and as they passed in melancholy review before him he stopped her to consult her on his own symptoms and to inquire of her whether she did not think such and such complaints were about to add to his bodily infirmities mrs calder who was always obliged to everybody who fancied her skill enabled her to answer such questions was delighted with the opportunity this afforded her of exhibiting her knowledge to willoughby from whom she could never procure the smallest voluntary attention and the conversation began so irksome that having waited near an hour and seeing it not likely to end willoughby at length started up and approached to take his uncle's hand when miss fitzhaman in all the languor of unhappy love swam into the room on her entrance willoughby sat down again as being unwilling to have her suppose he rudely fled from her approach she put on an air of affected humility and looked as if she thanked him for ever this slight mark of attention she gave a loud and deep sigh prolonged as much as possible her eyes robbed of their fire were turned mournfully upon him you are going from us mr willoughby said she in a subdued and faint voice he replied that business which could no longer be delayed made his return to england necessary another deep sigh was all the lady's answer to this information but lord castlenorth cried i am sorry to hear you say so george very sorry i did hope that we might have all returned together as soon as my complaints subside a little as to business you ought to remember that all your money matters might be easily settled if you pleased i thank you sir replied willoughby who saw whither the discourse would tend but those matters are the least of my concern stay however one day said lord castlenorth that you may execute some business for me surely nephew you will oblige me so far though every hour's delay was death to him he at length agreed on his uncle's repeated entreaties to stay four and twenty hours longer at naples and then leaving the room he was followed by the officious mrs calder who desiring leave to stay half a dozen words to him alone he suffered her to shrew him into another room she put on a most rueful countenance stroked her handkerchief plaited her ruffles and uttering an oh dear between a sigh and a groan she continued thus my dear good sir i wish to have a little conversation relative to your situation in this dear worthy family for every member of which my poor heart bleeds and yet madame interrupted willoughby impatiently there is perhaps hardly a family among your acquaintance who are in the opinion of the world so little objects of compassion the world exclaimed the lady lord bless me what signifies the opinion of the world the world cannot see as i do into all their feelings there's your most excellent uncle as worthy a man as ever existed sinking poor good dear man under five complaints all incurable and denied alas the only satisfaction this world has to give him seeing his darling daughter settled to his wishes which would smooth his path to heaven and leave him nothing but bodily pain which is severe enough nothing but bodily pain as i observed 
to contend with oh sir what heartfelt satisfaction it must be to you what comfortable reflection for a good heart such as inhabits your breast no doubt i say what delight it would be to you to hold forth the amiable hand that should rock the cradle of reposing age and soothe the latter days of so excellent and worthy an uncle the wine and the hypocritical grimace with which the speech was delivered would have conquered the gravity of willoughby at any other time but he now felt his disgust irritated by impatience amounting almost to rage but he repressed his feelings with difficulty unwilling by opposition to lengthen the conversation which mrs calder suffered not to languish but thus went on ah dear what a melancholy reflection as i observed it is to consider that poor good man this is not likely to happen and instead of it this darling daughter this fine young woman heiress to such a noble fortune so beautiful so accomplished so elegant undeniably the first match in england in point of rank and beauty and fortune so lovely in person so amiable in mind so elevated in understanding far alas from being happy sees her youth pass away in a hopeless passion from which her infancy she has been taught to cherish and which now her reason aided by her affronted pride tries in vain to repass oh mr willoughby mr willoughby the happiness that you refuse by how many would be courted the heart that you disdain to accept by how many would be adored dear creature when i see how thin she is grown and know the cause of it so well when i hear her sigh and know how injurious it is to her delicate constitution i really sir you will forgive my zeal i have looked upon you with amazement and have asked myself whether you have eyes whether you have a heart to what madame interrupted willoughby who could no longer endure her harangue patiently to what does all this tend tend dear sir replied mrs calder why certainly to open your eyes if possible to a sense of the happiness you are throwing away to prevail on you to answer the expectations of all your friends to consult your own interest and to become all you ought to be you mean well i conclude madame answered willoughby but all this but you mistake greatly when you suppose that the alliance to which you allude would contribute to the happiness of any of the parties for whom you are interested i have no heart to offer miss fitz Heyman, and if the partiality which you represent exists anywhere but in your own imagination it would be ungenerous to encourage and unworthy to avail myself of it feeling as i do that i never can answer it as i am very willing to allow the young lady's merits deserve excuse me therefore if i entreat of you never to consider b as being likely to be more closely united with the family of lord castlenorth than i at present am and to declare to you that by persisting in pressing it my uncle will put it out of my power to testify for him that regard and affection which i really feel willoughby then left the room and mrs calder piqued and mortified at the little success of her rhetoric went reluctantly to give an account to lady castlenorth by whom she had been employed 
of the ill success of her embassy. End of Volume 3, Chapter 8 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.